Øhm, ja, øhm, jeg vil i dag tale på engelsk for at lette jeres forståelse hele vejen igennem, undgå øh, de værste misforståelser. Øhm, derfor er titlen også på både svensk og på engelsk, så fra nu af er det på engelsk, men I må meget gerne spørge på svensk, og jeg vil enten svare på, på dansk eller engelsk, så må vi se hen ad vejen. But to minimize exposure to endocrine disruptors. First of all, thank you for inviting me here today. I am Marie Louise Holmer. I come from the Danish EPA. Um, I'm a biologist, and since I did my master thesis, actually since I did my bachelor degree at university, I've been interested in endocrine disruptors. Um, during the last seven years, I worked in, in the Danish Environmental Protection Agency within this area, but also with other aspects of risk assessment of chemicals and consumer products. Um, since I returned from maternity leave this spring, my main focus has been on endocrine disruptors. And in the next half year, in the first half year of 2012, uh, Denmark will have the EU presidency Um, and one of, our main, or one of our main focuses, very highly prioritized area um, in the environmental sector is going to be endocrine disruptors and, and also combination effects. Um, it's a, an area of very high priority in Denmark, as you've probably also understood from what has been said today. Um, before I move on, I'll just talk a little bit about the Danish Environmental Protection Agency, because you probably don't know the authorities in Denmark um, as, as well as, uh, as people in Denmark do. We are part of the Ministry of the Environment, and that means that we prepare the decision basis for the Minister for the Environment. We have a lot of very different tasks, and I have listed some examples here. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is our work on endocrine disruptors and our information to consumers about chemicals in consumer products. Just a short overview of what I will be um, talking about today will be something about uh, hard versus soft regulatory measures, why we focus on endocrine disruptors, um, about some of the investigations we do on chemicals in consumer products, and some of the recent consumer campaigns we have um, <clears throat> developed during the last years. The discussion in this room is going to focus on the right to know and the art of choosing. And as is also stated in the program, then to choose uh, one product over the other, you need to know the content of what you buy. And as Pia also said, that in some products that, that information is not really available. Um, whereas in cosmetics, you do have the ingredient list, but you also need some kind of tools or some kind of advice in order to translate what is uh, stated in the ingredient list. In the Nordic countries, we are lucky because we have both the EU flower and the Nordic Swan label, the um, uh, environmental marks, which uh, guide you towards products which, which live up to some criteria for human health and the environment. And one of our very general advices, if you wish to minimize exposure to chemicals, is to buy products with these environmental labels. And I will also return to that later. We are also going to discuss what is needed besides knowledge in order to change habits. And our not formalized working hypothesis is that motivation is needed. You need to realize that the situation is serious without being paralyzed by fear, and you need to feel that changing your habits can actually make a difference. In our campaigns, these considerations always play a role and are cautiously fitted to the target group we want to reach. At the same time, we aim to decide uh, simple advices which are easy to follow. First, a little bit about hard versus soft regulatory measures. And It's important to keep in mind here that with the REACH regulation, the responsibility has been put on industry to ensure that all chemical substances are used safely. Also for, for example, cosmetics and toys, it's the responsibility of the producers and the importers that only products which are safe to use are placed on the market. So why talk about the right to know and the art of choosing? Because ideally, This would not be necessary. In the ideal world, industry 
would know all possible effects of the substances they produce. And they would take this into concern and place only products on the markets when the use is safe. They, was also, they would also take into concern that we are exposed to many different substances from many different uh, sources at the same time. And this would mean that all products on the market would be safe to use and the consumer would not have to know or to make those informed choices. This is not the case. All substances are not investigated for all possible harmful effects. I think that has also been shown quite uh, obviously today. Um, and this is, it's simply not possible to investigate all substances for all possible harmful effects with the methods we have today. It would require an infinite number of animals and animal studies. And some effects we do not even know how to test for yet. Also, industry does not have to take combination effects into concern in the risk assessment of the chemicals. So in cases where we as authorities feel that the knowledge gap is too big, we use soft regulatory measures. And I return to that. But first, the hard regulatory measures. Our strategy is to use hard regulatory measures when the scientific evidence that a substance affects human health and or the environment and exposure is so high that it poses a risk. Then we work preferably for EU regulation. We can also use national regulation. And in cases where we see a global problem, we work for global conventions. And the soft regulatory measures, as we call them, our strategy is to use them when we have suspicions about a risk. That can be investigations showing unnecessary exposure or suspicion about effects which we cannot target regulatorily. That can be incentives for industry, for an example, to encourage substitution. And it can be information to the public, which, I, which I'm going to talk about today. And some of our general principles, as I said before, in those information campaigns is to avoid unnecessary use and to minimize the exposure to chemicals in general. But it's important to iterate here that at the same time we work to increase the knowledge and to make regulation possible in the future. For an example, by developing appropriate test methods, developing criteria, for an example, for the endocrine disruptors, as is the case today. I'll return to that a little bit later. So why focus on the endocrine disruptors? I think a lot of what I plan to say has actually been, been uh, talked about already. So I will not go into all those points here. Um, I'll just let your eyes, let you <laughs> let your eyes roll down over those things has been said before today already. And I think also this slide, I will only, I will only um, uh, underline the last bit that we do not know all effects, we do not know all substances, and we do not know whether the concentrations we are exposed to in everyday life are harmful. And the more knowledge we get, the more worried we become, especially when we take the combination effects into concern. And with the combination effects, I mean that we are exposed to many different substances from different sources. And I have listed some of the well-known endocrine disruptors and, and where they, they can be found. Well, just some examples here. And these sources are covered by a number of different regulations in the EU. And therefore, we have in Denmark a network between the relevant authorities where we meet and discuss the issue of endocrine disruptors twice a year. When we look at those different sources, I think it's important to keep in mind that for an example for pharmaceuticals, the, positives, the positive effects of having life-saving medicine might outweigh the risk posed by exposure to endocrine disruptors. The side effects are tolerated in a much more extensive way than for consumer products, where the substances can more easily be substituted or alternative solutions be developed. Um, 
we have a lot of activities going on focusing on endocrine disruptors. I just very shortly uh, tell you about this. We have a strategy in Denmark where we focus on knowledge building and development of test methods, action or, in, or intended investigations and regulation. And we have a Dan Danish chemicals action plan which supports those activities like you also have now gotten uh, a Swedish chemicals action plan from Shemi. Within knowledge building, we have a center for endocrine disruptors and it aims to build up knowledge for use in the preventive work in the authorities. And main focus is on exposure. We have a few biomonitoring studies going on and also effects of endocrine disruptors on, and combined exposure to endocrine disruptors. And then we have some investigations of endocrine disruptors in consumer products. I'll return a little bit to that. Um, and we have a network both with Danish scientists where we meet twice a year with the epidemiologist, this, the scientist which work with the, who work with rats in the laboratory and scientists who work with um, fish and uh, other uh, wildlife species in the laboratory. And that has been a very fruitful cooperation leading to some uh, cross uh, using each, each other's information much, much earlier in a process than would all otherwise be possible. And then we have this network also with the other Danish authorities. <clears throat> I mentioned that we also work hard to move the knowledge about endocrine disruptors toward a more systematic regulation of the substances. And I will just shortly touch upon some of this work. Um, a first step towards a systematic regulation is to get criteria for endocrine disruptors and that is under, develop in, under development in the EU at the moment. There's a deadline for the Commission to propose a set of criteria in December 2013 for use in the pesticides regulation and we work for those criteria to be applicable across all the relevant EU legislations. Another big activity in here is to develop test methods because it has been difficult to identify endocrine disruptors since no test methods were available to detect these effects 10 years ago. Now we have developed some internationally accepted test methods to detect endocrine disruptors in the OECD. And they are not yet part of the standard information requirements in the EU legislation. But that's the next step to get them transferred into the EU and into the EU legislation. And those test methods, they address some of the effects we've heard today about today on the estrogen system, on the androgen system, and partly also on the thyroid system. But they do not include emerging endpoints like obesity, for an example, which we heard about today. So there's still a lot of work to do in developing test methods, which also include those endpoints. And then we have the combination effects. And as I mentioned before, we are exposed to those many different substances from many sources. And these kinds of combination effects are not addressed in the current EU legislation. Denmark and Sweden together has raised this issue in the EU. And also next year under the Danish EU presidency, it will have a high pro priority to move this area forward. When we have the criteria and the test methods are impl implemented in the EU legislation and we have a guidance also on how to interpret the studies we, we, um, we, or the test methods we, uh, we perform, we can move towards a more systematic regulation of endocrine disruptive sub substances. But until then, we need the soft regulatory measures. We need this signaling lists and we need the information to the consumers. And I will just mention shortly the EU list of suspected endocrine disruptors because that's uh, a strong signaling list which is used, for an example, uh, in the criteria to, for getting the Swan label on the cosmetics, pro cosmetics product, products. Um, and, um, and it was developed 10 years ago as part of the EU strategy <clears throat> for endocr endocrine disruptors. I will now move to talk a little bit about the program for investigation of chemicals and consumer products we have in Denmark. Um, we, get, 
we get the knowledge we have on substances from many different sources. In the registrations under REACH, a lot of information is submitted by, the, by industry. There are also a lot of peer-reviewed articles being produced all the time, and both OECD, WHO, UN, and other international bodies produce reports, and there are a lot of in national investigations from other countries. But we also have this program for investigation of chemicals in consumer products in Denmark, which I will just talk, uh, talk a little bit about. Since 2001, more than 100 reports have been published. And the aim is to reduce possible risks for, for, um, and ensure a high level of protection of consumer health. And how do we do that? We investigate chemical substances in, select, in selected product types, cosmetics, toys, paints, textiles, and so on, and we assess the risk. And that way, we identify need for new regulation, we make advice to consumers, that are some of the campaigns I'm going to return to later. We made guidance to importers so they can ask suppliers for adequate information. And we used information we get in cooperation and information exchange with other countries. Usually those risk assessments have been on single substances from single products. But recently we have also done risk assessments of exposure to multiple substances from multiple sources. Um, and that was the basis for this uh, folder here and the campaign toward two-year-olds about the uh, endocrine disruptors um, and how to avoid those in the daily life. I'll return to that also. This program forms the basis for many of, of our consumer campaigns. I have put up some of the recent uh, campaigns here. I have brought some folders, uh, so if any of you are interested in those, you're welcome to come up and collect one uh, later. Um, the pink one over here is about allergy and the target group is teenagers. Uh, we believe that sensitizing substances should be avoided as a default in order to minimize the risk of developing allergy. And therefore, for example, we advise to, to uh, avoid use of perfume in general. The two other campaigns, the folders here, they also take allergy into concern in some of their the advices, advices, but they also focus on how to avoid endocrine disruptors. The first of them is this one. Good chemistry, nine good habits. It's from 2006, and um, it aimed at pregnant and nursing mothers. The background was a lack of knowledge among women of the childbearing age of chemicals and the chemicals implications during pregnancy and nursing. And, we, and there's a knowledge needed to make those everyday choices, as we talked about earlier. Also, the pregnancy and the breastfeeding periods are sensitive. As also been illustrated earlier, it's the unborn child, which is one of the most sensitive uh, periods of uh, a person's life. The campaign addressed consumers in general, but aimed, targeted especially, um, Pregnant women, as you also can see from the folder, it talks very much to, to uh, young women who are going to be mothers. It's a little baby and a bear in the front. And it gave nine good habits. We used a network work of doctors and midwives and healthcare professionals for the distribution. And we made both a pre-evaluation and an after-evaluation, and that showed that we had very good results both on the knowledge level increased and attitudes increased in the target group and also the behavior was increased, increased or the behavior was changed in a much higher degree than we actually had expected. This one is still distributed and updated and reprinted and that was done latest in 2009. It has its own, own homepage also which is still fre frequently visited. Uh, the other campaign I'm I'm just going to introduce you to is the one behind this folder. Um, oh, sorry, no, it's not. I'm just going to show you the advices if you're interested. Um, they are in Danish, so a little bit of a mismatch here. Hope that's okay. Um, den første, brug så lidt kosmetik og creme som muligt, mens du gravide armer. Vel altid uparfumerede produkter, og lad være med at bruge parfume, mens du er gravid og ammer. Som I kan se, er der også nogle af rådene, der knytter sig til allergi. 
Farv ikke hår, mens du er gravid og ammer. Køb miljømærkede produkter, når det er muligt. Se efter svanen og blomsten. Undgå at bruge produkter på spraydåse og lad være med at male, mens du er gravid og ammer. Og så de råd, vi gav til de nybagte møder over for børnene eller babyerne. Hvad skal alle ting til din baby før brug? Også tøj og legetøj og stof og plast. Lad være med at bruge creme, sæbe og lignende til din baby dagligt. Køb altid duft og parfumefri produkter til din baby og også legetøj. Og giv kun din baby legetøj, som er beregnet til babyer. Then the next campaign, which is this one. 65.000 reasons for better chemistry. 65.000 refers to that 65.000 children approximately are born in Denmark every year. If you don't know that, it doesn't give a lot of sense, the name. The background for that was <coughs> an investigation we made <coughs> of the total exposure uh, of a two-year-old child to endocrine disrupting substances uh, in chemical products. We used the best suitable concept, the dose addition model, to calculate the risk from the combined exposure. We had both consumer products in the investigation, indoor environment and food. And substantial risks were identified in all scenarios, meaning both there was a winter scenario and a summer scenario. And the conclusion was that there is a need to, to reduce the exposure to endocrine disrupting substances from food and the indoor environment, but also from consumer products. That was followed up by a campaign which targeted parents and grandparents to two-year-old children, approximately, of course, also those a bit younger and a bit older, with eight good advices to minimize the exposure of two-year-olds. Um, but the advices can also be used by other population groups. We made a folder and a poster, and um, there's also a homepage for, for this campaign. Actually, this campaign or the investigation also uh, led to some regulation for the parabens. We have made a national ban for four parabens in products to children, and that is actually discussed in the EU right now, whether this ban should be transferred to cover the whole EU. And for phthalates, we have proposed a regulation of four Uh, phthalates based on uh, combined exposure. And that's phthalates in all uh, indoor products or products you are in contact with. The eight good advices given in this folder is sørg for godt indeklima, luft ud og gør rent, servere varieret mad og brug egnet køkkenrej. And there you can see that we also co have cooperated with the uh, the food authorities in Denmark in order to include advices which are meaningful on their resort area because this is not uh, the Danish EPA's resort area. Køb svanemærket plejeprodukter. Køb plejeprodukter uden parfume. Undgå de farligste talater. Vask nye produkter før brug. Og smid gammel blødt plastlegetøj ud. Køb CE-mærket og uparfumeret legetøj. So that was the two campaigns I was going to talk about. In our Nordic cooperation, we, um, <clears throat> in 2010, last year in the autumn, uh, Denmark had the chairmanship for the Nordic Council of Ministers. And, uh, and in uh, connection to that, we arranged three workshops in, uh, in Denmark about endocrine disruptors for the Nordic authorities. And uh, one of those uh, workshops was about Uh, soft regulatory measures. And the outcome was, of that was a network uh, between the Nordic authorities to exchange information about endocrine disruptors and information to the public about endocrine disruptors. And uh, the conclusions or the outcomes I also brought, well, I will show you afterwards. We have um, the re report from the workshop can be found on the homepage of the Nordic Council of Ministers. Uh, with all those conclusions also included. But the conclusions were that, well, in general, when you communicate about endocrine disruptors, the communication should be positive, warm, and focused on relatively few practical advices. We should use experience from consumers in the development of campaigns. We need to target women before pregnancy, since exposure and accumulation of chemicals may start a long time before. We need to target teenagers, since their use of cosmetics is a major source for chemical exposure. Eco-labels should be promoted. And we should include importance of food and the working environment. And we should 
make the information available through channels already used by the target group. And that NGOs can help the campaign effort by supporting the messages and put spotlight on, for an example, individual products. Many of those uh, conclusions are implemented and taken on board in the next campaign planned in the Danish uh, Environmental Protection Agency. And that's a campaign which um, has the same background as the, this one, which is a big investigation about the combined exposure of pregnant women, this time pregnant women, to combine, uh, combined exposure to endocrine disruptors, both from food, indoor environment, consumer products, and so on. Uh, the campaign is planned for 2000 and, uh, the spring 2012, um, and it will address both the pregnant and the before pregnant women. So just to sum up the last slide, um, if single substances represent a risk, it will be addressed by the authorities. We will use hard regulatory measures. If there's a suspicion about a risk, we use soft regulatory measures for an example, information campaigns. Endocrine disruptors is one of the areas where we find the soft regulatory measures very useful, especially because we are exposed daily to many different substances from many different sources. And this kind of exposure is not taken into concern in the EU regulation. In parallel to the soft regulatory measures, we work intensely to increase knowledge and if needed to move the area closer to a more systematic regulation. So that was the words. You're welcome to ask questions. Um, and I put in some links here. So if the presentation is to be distributed, you can find the links to the home pages I've talked about today. Thanks. Thank you, Marilis. Nu ska vi se. Nu anar jag att det finns några frågor här i publiken kanske. Har vi någon som springer runt med mikrofoner? Yes, yes det har vi en där. Eh, har vi någon spontan fråga så där? Nej, ni vill suga på den lite. Ja, titta. Varsågod. Nu ska vi se om vi kan få mikrofon. Tänker mig för om ni har en produkt som ni misstänker är farlig och ni vill använda den mjuka och informera folk om att inte använda den här. Kan det då vara så att företaget vill stämma er för att ni för en falsk marknadsföring emot dem? Eller hur hanterar ni den problematiken och uppkommer den? Um, maybe it's because I'm not so good in Swedish, I'm sorry, but can you... Uh, om ni pekar ni ut, om ni hittar till exempel en produkt som mm -hmm. ni vet är, mm. innehåller en kemikalie eller som ni tycker är en mm. farlig produkt. Mm. Farlig, mm. Kan ni då peka ut den här och säga använd inte den? Och um. brukar företagen i så fall säga app, app, app? Ni får inte säga så. Um, no, as a rule we don't point out uh, specific products. Uh, we, in Denmark we have Forbrugerrådet, um, which consumer, what is it called? Like a, it's also an NGO working for the consumers. Consument organization. Oh. And actually, in connection to this campaign, they made um, a campaign where they pointed out uh, specific substances and specific products, um, and which made a lot of. Uh, um, a lot of uh, press, uh, uh, call, a lot of discussion in the public fora, um, but but we we cannot really do that as authorities. Nej, det är en skillnad på myndighet och andra organisationer yeah. så. But we can give them more like general advices on which choices you have, and for an example, going for the Swan label for for the cosmetics is a uh, very um, good way forward. Det var svaret på frågan. En till fråga där uppe. Ska vi se vad vi har mikrofonen? Ja, hej, jag ville fråga. Ni hade, eh, ville begränsa antalet talater i plastprodukter till fyra. Hur kom ni fram till just den summan? Fanns det någon 
forskning bakom den summan och hur, mycket, hur många olika saxflatalater brukar det finnas i mm. produkter? Jag tänkte på fyra, låter yeah. mycket, men... Ja, yeah. tack. We chose the four, the four phthalates we have chosen are the one which are classified for reproductive effects. And we applied this uh, combined exposure way, which is the first time that, is, that has been proposed under REACH that we actually uh, propose to regulate because of combination effects, the combined exposure. And we think that the most efficient way forward is to use then only the substances or include only the substances which we know are classified, where we know that we agree on the toxic ecological effects of them. So that's why. Skal vi se om vi har fler frågor? Jo. Eh, det var nära. Or på tasken från uppe från Norrbotten. Jag funderar på det här. Det finns en en sak som vi ytterst sällan hör och det är ju självklart att en myndighet och kanske vare i sig i Sverige eller i Danmark skulle föreslå, men det är icke-konsumtion. Det vill säga att, att minska den totala konsumtionen. Jag har lite svårt med, med kvinnor. Och speciellt med kvinnor som sminkar sig starkt. För jag tycker de är så himla fula, ursäkta. Men däremot kvinnor som inte sminkar sig ser jättehärliga ut. Det är någonting i det. Men det kanske beror på också traditioner då. För att i min omgivning då så har det inte funnits. Det har inte, man har inte sminkat sig helt enkelt. Och det, är ju, det här är ju en trend va? Det här, jag tror att man skulle kunna bryta oerhört mycket på det här. Men att föreslå icke-konsumtion. Är det en fråga? Ja, det är... Skulle en myndighet som ni kunna föreslå icke-konsumtion? Um, yeah. Yes, I, th I think, I think we, we do that to a quite large extent by advising to minimize your own exposure, to minimize your use of cosmetics, um, which is one of the advices we have in, in this one. It's actually, yeah minimize your use and in that sense that is what you are asking for i guess. Och nu är ju den ju särskilt riktad till gravida och ammande kvinnor yeah. men man skulle kunna kanske kunna tänka sig att utöka kampanjer till att nå andra målgrupper också. Ja. Yeah. Um, yeah, as, as I said when on the Nordic workshop we held um, a lot of discussion was about that the pregnant are the main target group here the pregnant women are the main target group but we also need to target women before they become pregnant because of substances bioaccumulating and accumulating in in the body so so we we would actually need to target women as soon as we can reach them um and that we have to to think about how to do because well technically it's much much easier to talk to the pregnant women because she wants a lot of information she's really motivated to take it in whereas the teenager um is maybe not so motivated uh, to take in advices about her future baby somewhere way 15 years ahead so that's for us to 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 use in in our future planning of campaigns ha fler frågor Jag undrar hur ni har mätt effekten av era kampanjer. Du sa att kunskapen har ökat, men kan ni också kontrollera på vilket sätt beteende har ändrats hos målgruppen? Um, no, we have not we have not measured like which products have been sold from different shops or stuff. The evaluation was uh, done by interviewing um, people in the target group and asking them if they knew the campaign and if they had changes, changed their um, knowledge and if it had changed their um, behavior. So it was only self-reported, you could say, um, evaluation. We have one question from Urpo. 
Jag vet inte, det var kanske några av er som såg programmet. Jag vet inte om det var dokument utifrån eller något sånt där nyligt. Eh, och det var ju utifrån Europa, eh, gränserna mot Europa. Och där det helt uppenbarligen är så att, att det börjar komma upp, upp, ut ganska mycket piratvaror inom olika produkter. Eh, eh, något exempel var ju... Eh, hade ju då med jordbruk att göra där det kom alltså bekämpningsmedel eh, som i och för sig är, är dåliga men som dessutom inte var det de, det stod på dem. Och det exemplet som, som jag tänkte på i det här sammanhanget då, var alltså eh, produkter som, som eh, var alltså inom kosmetikabranschen då, som inte innehöll alls det de, de, och var alltså piratprodukter som då säljs med, med falska varumärken och sånt där. Eh, är det något problem som har upptäckts så att säga i Danmark eh, än, eller är det bara så att säga gränserna utav Europa som utsätts för det här? Tydligen en oerhört omfattande industri. Well, it's, it's nothing we have been um, uh, that we have experienced or uh, been uh, What is called? Oh, I lack a word here. Um, but the short answer is, is no, I think. <laughs> We haven't experienced it. Um, but I think that uh, we as, as authorities, we, we, might, we might, if very lucky, pick up something like that through our chemicals inspection if we had a uh, target looking into or goal of looking into that specific product group at that time but otherwise it is illegal those illegal things going on we can't really regulate um, but of course we we have to to have attention on it so yeah ska se om fler frågor någon kanske där Jag har en fråga kring ungdomar, tonåringar och allergi. Du nämnde att ni har jobbat, du visade ett blankt, en blank framsida på ett magasin. Hur har den kampanjen fungerat på just tonåringar och parfym? Det var den här. Och din fråga är, sorry, hur det har fungerat? Om den har utvärderats så om ni har kunnat se effekter även på kampanjen mot... Yeah, if we have evaluated this yes. also. Mm. This I don't know so much about, so I have to, I cannot really answer. But um, I'm sure we have evaluated it, and I'm sure that the evaluation is available on our homepage, as also the evaluations of the other campaigns are, because that's something we usually do. Jag vet att det har gjorts en utvärdering av den, eller man har testat, eller man har sett i alla fall att den har gått hem hos många fler, för man har gjort det andra året man gör den, den kampanjen. Och första året var 2008, rätta mig, nej, någonstans, några år sedan. Och så gjorde man den igen. Och första gången man gjorde undersökningen, eller kampanjen, så fick man ett ganska bra genomslag. Man frågade alltså om, om ungdomar hade sett och om man hade ändrat sitt beteende. Och de siffrorna steg andra året man gjorde kampanjen. Så att det är ändå ett bra resultat. Mm. Ja, kampanjer är bra. Och ni är modiga. Jag tycker ni är jättemodiga. Tack. Fler sådana. En till fråga. Ja, en fråga till mm. angående hårfärg och ungdomar. Eller tonåringar. Där jag tycker mig se en trend att nu är det ganska självklart att man färgar håret. Man börjar färga håret när man är 14-15. Om man ser en klass med ungdomar så i den åldern så är det... Ja, mer än hälften som har färgat håret. Mm. Jag tänker om man håller på med det så påverkas nog kroppen ganska mycket. Om det man tar för vana att färga hår, byta hårfärg några gånger per år. Ehm, och om, det, om ni kommer ha kampanj om det också i framtiden. Om det är något du tror kommer komma. But you, you ask whether the coloring of the hair is also included in this? Oh. No, if, it's, if you are going to campaign about that in the future, if you see... 
a need to campaign on uh, hair dyeing. Yeah, actually, hair dyeing is part of this campaign also. So it's one part of of the the um, advices we give that we don't think that young people under 16 years should color their hair. <coughs> and yeah, and also explanation about why in this little folder. Yeah. Det man ska veta om den kampanjen är ju också att den eh, handlar om hudallergi. Mm. Eh, du talade mycket om hormonstörande ämnen eh, och det, även i hårfärg finns det alltså hormonstörande ämnen och det är en, en ingrediens <coughs> som förekommer i, jag ska säga, i stort sett all hårfärg. Eh, en hormonstörande eh, kemikalie som man vet påverkar eh, sköldkörtel och även, man har även misstänkta såna här eh, diabeteskopplingar i all hårfärg. Och för att göra en snygg påa, har ni fler frågor? En till fråga. Jag tar min påa efter. I'm thinking about the drinking water. Uh, cosmetic we can choose not to use, but the water is necessary that we drink from the tap. And I know that Denmark has detected a lot of chemicals from the company Monsanto and their pesticides called Roundup. And my question is, what are you as an authority doing about the use of these chemicals that farmers are using? Mm. Yeah, I think it's a good, it's a valid question. Um, well, unfortunately, in the Danish EPA, we are divided into one division handling chemicals in consumer products and one division handling pesticides and biocides. And therefore, I'm not really into the case with the uh, Roundup in the drinking water. Um, so I would hesitate to, to, to answer you um, here. Det är också en stor fråga. Men jag skulle vilja berätta på tal om det här med hårfärger, att inför den här seminariet så förberedde jag mig lite och jag har en 21-åring och en 19-åring. Jag frågade 21-åringen hemma, det är en hon, som färgar håret. Och så sa jag till henne, vad skulle kunna få dig att sluta färga håret eller att inte färga håret? Ingenting. Så. Hur snabbt som helst, ingenting. Och då tänker jag, då är hon född av mig som tycker att de här frågorna är väldigt viktiga och har säkert försökt att, att få henne att, att veta och bete sig på ett sätt som är kanske bättre. Och hon bor dessutom hemma hos mig och har inte fått göra det hemma. För att hårfärg kan man inte spola ut i vårt avlopp för där har vi egen brunn och groder och, och sånt. Det vet, de vet mycket väl, men ingenting skulle kunna få henne att sluta färga håret. Och då tänker jag så här att det, den målgruppen är ju extremt svår att nå. Eh, därför att det där effekten av det man gör nu och det så jag lever just nu är så, det är så långt fram vad som kan hända. Alltså effekten av det på det sätt jag lever. Eh, även om hon vet att hon ska få barn en dag eller kanske få barn en dag så ligger den så långt fram så hon behöver inte ens bry sig om det där. Det är som ni vet eh, cancer och, och tobaksrökning. Det är väldigt långt fram, fast man vet kända fall får cancer, men man slutar ändå inte röka. Någonstans måste det beröra en ända längst in. Men det finns lyckade kampanjer. Jag tycker de där är fantastiskt bra. Jag säger det återigen. Och så finns det en sida till som förbrukelse, förbrukelse kemi heter det va? Jag ska leta reda på, snart ska jag leta reda på en adress tror jag och kunna leverera. I alla fall tills kemikalivandringen ikväll ska jag kunna leverera den. Men jag skulle vilja tacka Marie-Louise Tack. för din presentation och att du kom hit. Jättekul tycker jag. Och som sagt, jag gillar danskarna. Tack. Du får Tack så den flamsäkra katten. Tack så mycket. Tack.